We are right at two o'clock, so I will get started here. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we are gonna be talking about container registries, what kind of data they have access to, and what data they are not sharing with you if you're distributing your containers uh, on one of these registries. Um, just to quickly introduce myself, uh, my name is Avi Press. I'm the founder and CEO of SCARF, um, and we focus on this topic, providing better usage analytics for open source maintainers and open source projects. Um, before we start, um, these slides are available on GitHub. If you're wondering how I made such beautiful modern slides, this is an org mode document kind of generated into a thing. So feel free to um, take a look uh, or send, if you see anything uh, wrong with it, feel free to send me a pull request. Um, we've got 40 minutes for this talk, so feel free to jump in with questions if you have them. Um, cool, let's get started. So we'll talk about container registries today and what um, data they give you. Um, you know, most of us probably distribute containers from Docker Hub and they will give you by default just the total number of pulls that your container has ever had. This is cool. Um, other repository, uh, other, other container registries so like GitHub, they'll go a little bit deeper. They give you the total number of pulls per uh, repository and they'll also break it down by tag, which is helpful. Um, it's the same thing for key.io, uh, Red Hat's registry. Um, if you kind of stand up your own with AWS ECR, um, you will get a time series of that, which is also very helpful in a lot of cases. But we might want to know a lot more than that, right? If we get a million pulls on our container, was that from one person? Was that from a million people? Was that from 10? What was that? What do, that's a very hard number to make any sense of. You know, we also might want to know, like, what, what container runtime was it? Was it Docker, Container D, Cryo? You know, where did it come from? What architecture was it? Um, you know, what the host platform was if we, po if we um, you know, produce multi-arch images and just understanding kind of the impact of that. Um, we also might not want to know what companies are behind those downloads, especially if you are someone commercializing your open source. Um, the other thing that is kind of interesting is that, um, um, for those that don't know, any time a container is invoked, a container uh, runtime is going to check with the registry if it has the latest version of the given tag that you are running. And so, um, you know, you're only seeing polls, but the registry is actually even seeing the head requests on a manifest. So the registry actually knows when the container is being invoked. Um, that's another thing that you might want to know about. And so for any of these metrics that we're talking about, you might want a time series of those things. Like, you know, what, you know, what did these stats look like yesterday or the past week or before? Um, the only way with these registries that don't give you a time series, you have to monitor these stats and just record what they were at any given timestamp and you can do your own math, but that's kind of the only way to get that information if you are publishing to a registry like Docker Hub. Um, and so, yeah, there's kind of a lot of other things that we might want to understand that, um, that is kind of hard to get at today with uh, most of kind of the free offerings from these registries. Um, and so I don't want to necessarily make it sound so simple and you know, we're kind of glossing over some definitions. So like, let's talk about what we mean by a pull. Um, so in any given um, you know, container image, um, there's what we call a manifest file. And the manifest specifies all the details about your image. The layers, the, you know, uh, the you know, architecture, these kinds of things, they're all specified in a manifest file. The manifest file will point to one or more blobs, which is just the, the stuff, the meat that comprises the actual image itself. Um, you know, the blobs can be uh, hosted on some CDN. Um, the manifest will, will probably be somewhere else, and these things might not be in the same place. And the, the um, you know, the OCI registry specifications kind of define how all these things interact with one another and how the runtimes need to pull these things down. Um, oh yeah, so, so yeah, this is kind of an example of what a manifest might look like, um, you know, where we have kind of these media types. We know the sizes and the hashes of all the different things that we're gonna pull down and they might come with annotations that kind of give us the ability to add more metadata. So, what is a pull? Like, what, what, what do we mean when we say a pull? And it's, it's more complicated than most of us uh, would expect. Um, so Docker will define a pull as one or two get requests on a manifest. Um, and so typically what that looks like is that there's kind of, you know, whatever domain we're looking at, there's gonna be a V2 prefix on kind of most of how modern 
um, container registries are working. Um, there's some identifiers for the repository that we're looking at, and manifests will be the thing to say, hey, we're, we're grabbing the manifest for this thing at a particular um, tag that comes after. A normal image pull will make one uh, request to a manifest, but if we are fetching a multi-arch image, we might fetch two manifests. So it's like already getting a little bit more complicated because now we have to kind of keep track of what kind of thing was being fetched to know if this is one or two downloads. So it's already getting a little bit more complicated. Um, it's important to know. So if we, you know, if we fetch like v1, the v1 tag of some image and then we try to pull it again. Uh, most clients are going to ask the registry, hey, do I have the latest of this manifest? It'll send a head request. The registry will respond with kind of the, you know, the metadata of, of that manifest. If we're up to date, we do nothing and we stop. Um, but that's even the case if we do like a Docker run um, on an image. We're just going to implicitly check with the registry, send a head request, are we up to date? get the response back, and if we need to do a subsequent get, um, if we do need to fetch something, uh, a second get will be, uh, will be sent. Um, and so these head requests are not counted as pulls. Um, notice, we're not talking about blobs, we're not talking about anything else, it's just the manifest. So if you do kind of like a partial download and then you do it again, that's still one download. Um, and you know uh, these, these runtimes are are typically going to cache very aggressively. So just to give a little bit more details of what this looks like, um, you know typically a um, the the container runtime is going to need to do like an auth handshake with the registry. Um, if we are just doing a anonymous request from scratch and we're gonna send up um, an auth request with no token whatsoever, the registry is gonna respond saying like, hey, you need to go get a token and here's where you need to get it from. But once the, uh, once the auth dance has been done, uh, yeah, we can then send that head request um, for the manifest if we don't already have one locally. Once we verify that we need one, we will do a get. Uh, maybe you will do a second get, um, and then you will read the manifest, get subsequent blobs, go get your blobs, and you're done. But these can be like interrupted any given time. And so even here, like we're already starting to see some of the subtleties of this where um, you know, we might do the bulk of the thing that we would think of as a pull, but it's not really counted. Even if you see all that output of like, oh, we're downloading all these different layers, we're doing all these different things, um, that pull might not have actually been logged. Um, and so we're already starting to, um, you know, as, as, as a maintainer, you know, wanting to see these stats, you're already like not seeing the full picture of what's going on because we're only really tracking that very first thing that was fetched. You know, whether that's the right or wrong way to do it is like a totally separate topic, but like this is the complexity that, that the registries are dealing with um, when doing poll counting. Um, and so, you know, one thing that is really, so, so yeah, there's a few things that are hard about this. Like obviously, um, if we wanna count these things, we have to span multiple API calls. Um, you know, if you see one or two manifest request, you have to do some work to figure out if that was one or two pulls and it's contextual. Um, so now if these things are being routed to different servers, oh gosh, what do you do? Like you now have to have like uh, time series context in order to like really do pull counting as these specs are described. Um, yeah, obviously we have this manifest and blobs difference, but then I think what makes this really, really hard um, is that different clients are going to respect the OCI standard to different degrees, um, and that is very, very tricky. Um, in theory, clients are gonna just call that head, uh, make that head request, and then they'll do a get when they need to. In reality, it does not uh, always work like that. Um, you know, you have things like older versions of a lot of different clients that just did not do this. They're just gonna make a get request every time, no matter what happens, even if nothing was downloaded, even if everything was up to date. Um, in practice, there are a lot of, um, you know, interactions with containers from things like the Go HTTP client from, you know, like whether it's Helm or Kubernetes or other, um, other, you know, kinds of software that just try to keep dependencies up to date or do uptime checking or these kinds of things, they may or may not respect these standards. Um, and so 
it, in practice, this means that a lot of stats are kind of blown up in a way that is not really correct, but it's just that it's really complex to actually get a correct number here. It's even worse than that, <laughs> actually. Um, so there have been bugs in various uh, container runtimes where they just fetch manifests twice for reasons. And you know, this is one of those things where like in the moment where a developer is saying, oh, it's actually really convenient for this thing that I'm doing right here in this one part of this one code base, it's hard for me to grab from cache or something, I'm just gonna fetch it again. And this is the kind of thing where like if you, I mean, you know, this was back in 2021, but these kinds of bugs leak into all sorts of different clients that are all doing slightly different things. This is a mess, but this is where we are. Um, and so this actually is the kind of thing that um, we actually encountered this um, when we were trying to do all this kind of pull counting back in 2021 and we had to open issues with like cryo and container D for various things where they were not really doing the right thing all the time. Um, and so, you know, for someone in like scarf position or even someone like at, you know, Docker Hub or GHCR or these other places when they wanna give stats, like this is not trivial to do. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done kind of upstream to make everything kind of behave nicely. Okay, um, now, so, you know, we've talked a little bit about like what it is that we're counting and now what I'm trying to say here is that there's actually a lot of good information in these polls. Um, so the registry can see things like headers, um, it can see time series information, um, and uh, the third bullet that uh, seems to have not made it in here is also an IP address of the connection that was doing the download. Um, they all see these IP addresses. Um, and so, there's a lot of headers and a lot of information in here. So, you know, we're gonna get like a request ID. We might, we might know where we are kind of in the, you know, in the network hopping. Um, they typically get an auth token, which can be kind of a stable identifier of sorts. Um, and then they have a user agent, which tells us a lot of stuff. It tells us about the runtime that we're running. It tells us about, um, you know, the upstream, the upstream um, operating system and architecture as well as the thing that was above that outside of the container runtime in even things like the, you know, what version of Go is being run and a lot of data in there. Um, and it's a lot of data that can be really helpful if you're wondering things about like, you know, what are my, what architecture are my users actually running this container on? There's a lot of stuff in here. This also gives us a really important thing, which is a notion of uniqueness. Um, and so if we wanna know how many users do I have, I had a million polls, but how many users was actually, you know, in that million polls, there's actually some clues in here that can help, uh, can help surface that information for us. Um, of course, things like platform are also really helpful as well. When you get that bug from someone about why your thing doesn't work on BSD, like how much should you focus your time on that? It's not clear, um, but the, the registries do kind of have this information. Um, the, yeah, and so, you know, the thing here is that a lot of the, when we look at these really, really aggregated statistics, we can get a very misleading view of things. Um, and the thing that's really interesting is that the IP address actually has a lot of useful information. Um, if you wanna know where in the world your users are, the IP address has that information. Um, if you are someone that's working on open source in a commercial setting, you might wanna know if your downloads are coming from companies or individuals or you know, companies versus you know, government organizations or, the, or these kinds of things. The registries have this information. Um, is your software being installed on a laptop or CI or is it being deployed to production? These things really, really matter if you're a maintainer. Um, you know, which cloud environments do we need to optimize for? Like where is this stuff getting used? Um, what percentage of your polls are coming from a service like Watchtower, which is continually just sitting and monitoring and pulling and pulling and pulling. And if it's an old version of Watchtower, it is getting and getting and getting manifests and blowing up your stats. Um, and so for a lot of folks, their poll counts are actually a bit lower than the registries would report because there's a lot of this kind of crappy data in there. Um, knowing all this stuff can really kind of material Im materially impact us as, uh, as open source maintainers. 
Another thing is just that this, the, the notion of uniqueness can be really, really useful for a lot of different purposes. And so um, there's an organization called Linux Server that has been working with SCARF, or using SCARF for a while. It's a non-commercial open source uh, group. And what they do is they, they take a bunch of like popular applications and they dockerize them. And so they, and they redistribute these images of just a variety of software that people can just run. Um, they have billions and billions of pulls of their software. And they, when they started working with SCARF, they looked at one of the images that they're distributing, WireGuard, um, and they found that a lot of the trends that they were seeing and the total uh, pulls that they were getting had no connection to the number of actual unique users that were behind that traffic. Um, yeah, so they had 73,000 pulls just from 20 users, and it was just, 20 IP addresses that maybe had like misconfigured CI jobs or whatever it was, but there were big spikes and there was nothing substantial underneath them. Other, other packages they had, the data of totals and uniques kind of kept a little bit more in sync with each other on trends. And if you were just looking at total download counts, you would be really misled by this. Um, but that data really matters, oh, sorry, that data matters. And you know the crazy thing about this. So so you know, Scarf is a venture-backed company, and so you know, we, when we deal with you know what investors want to see and what kind of investors look for when they're deploying capital, um, people will show charts on the left like this with no uniques. They just show download counts, and people see that people see that steep increase, and millions of dollars are deployed on signals like this. It's wrong. It's garbage. Millions and millions of dollars have been deployed incorrectly because they look at these signals and it's garbage. This is where we are. Um, and the registries have this data. It's crazy. It is fundamentally insane. Um, now, the registry sees even more than this. You know, we as developers want to know how is our software actually being used, right? Um, and so if we look at the time series of requests and what is happening, it actually gives us quite a lot of clues. Um, so let's look at this, right? We see, what, what do we see here? So, um, you know, every, every, every request is to the exact same path. It's just for the latest version of some manifest of some image. Um, we do one head request. We do one get right after, and then we check head again every five minutes. You know, kind of straightforward. And you know, what does this tell us? Like, we are we we pulled something once, and then we may have invoked it several times, or we were checking for updates. Um, and so, oops, sorry here. So, um, you know, what this tells us, since we're we're pulling for the latest version. Maybe this is a production deployment. This might just be internal tooling that's always trying to keep up to date with something, but we have a little bit of clues here. And we haven't even incorporated like the user agents and the headers and these kinds of other things. This is just the time series of requests that were made. Let's look at this one. Um, so here we have some kind of, you know, we have some kind of um, irregular intervals of polling. We've pulled multiple versions. Um, you know, in kind of a random way. And, and what's really likely with a, with a use case like this is that this is probably local development. So it's like very different signals and that's good to know, especially if you are a maintainer of a project. Um, and I think that, yeah, I think that, you know, the last thing that I'll say about this is just that the, you know, the, the impact that we are having when we build and ship the software and how it gets used in practice can just have a really big impact on how we prioritize our time as maintainers um, and helps us understand the impact that our work is having. And knowing, you know, how many of my polls were going to local development versus, you know, some random, um, you know, some random internal tool versus production, like this stuff matters. This stuff really matters. Um, and so, okay. The registries have some data. We don't have it. What do we do? Um, what, what can we do to do better? One thing that you can do is open a ticket with your registry and try to convince them to give you this data. Um, this has historically not worked, and, but if you would like to pick up your ax and uh, fight the good fight, let us know how we can help and let me know how it goes. Um, more registries should give access to this data. It's a shame that they don't. But you know, we've talked about you know the complexity of doing this, and the reality is the business model is a lot of these platforms. It's just not really part of their business model. Um, one thing that you can do is you can host your own registry. Um, you know, you can send people to do a Docker pull from your own domain slash your image. Um, 
there are open source solutions that can let you just stand up a registry from scratch, um, and you will have access to everything. You'll have all the data that you want. The problem, there's a lot of problems, but one problem is that um, containers are humongous and you will be footing the bill for that massive amount of bandwidth. The other really tricky part is that, you know, in open source, we just put stuff out there and the reality is this stuff is used all around the world. And if you want to not to make sure that you, people in the US have fast speeds and people in India have fast speeds and everywhere in between and they're not getting timeouts and, you know, sending multiple gigabytes all the time, it's expensive, it's hard, it requires a lot of resources. And so, one idea that we had at SCARF is that um, to introduce the concept of a registry gateway. And so the fundamental idea is, okay, so we already have a registry with all this stuff. We have users uh, on the other side. What if we put a very lightweight service in the middle that we direct users to to start? It transparently redirects the request to wherever it needs to go, and you can process the data as you know, passively as the traffic flows through the gateway. You can still get the exact same experience of Docker pull, you know, your domain.com with an image. It looks just like it's being hosted on a private registry. But in reality, you're just pushing to Docker Hub or GHCR or whatever that looks like. So that's the idea. Um, and so, you know, this has kind of the different, different pros and cons here. So like we still get all the request data. Um, the service can be pretty lightweight and dumb. It's just passing requests back to some other host. Um, you don't even really need to understand the API you're sitting in front of. You're just sending stuff through um, pretty passively. Um, and interestingly, this permanently decouples you from the registry behind you. You could switch registries instantaneously and not break things for your users. You can dual publish and switch between them or load balance between different registries. And there's some kind of cool effects of that. You can also distribute stuff from your own domain. And this can work for things that are not containers, which is kind of neat. Um, but of course, there are drawbacks to this. Um, you know, it's another single point of failure in a way. You can still go directly to the registry, but like that URL may or may not stop working. And then you have another performance choke point here. So it's not something that can just be done willy nilly, but it is, um, it is a solution to this. And you know, when I say simple, like I mean really simple. Like you can do this and you know, you can do this in three lines of Nginx and you're done, right? That's pretty neat. Um, but there's a little bit more work to do because just having one server that is doing this is not necessarily enough. Um, the gateway still needs to be fast and available and the really unfortunate part is you can't actually always redirect. I wish it was this simple, but in reality it is not. Um, in some cases, you can't redirect, you have to proxy. And you have to proxy because, uh, so where I had this, this off handshake where we begin, um, it turns out, I don't remember if I have another slide, yeah, so some, some clients, again, like it's all about these old clients and making sure that they keep working. Some clients are gonna mess up that token request if they get redirected. Um, now, we are working to like go back and kind of patch all these things so we can stop proxying, but for, for, you know, for the, the meantime, there's just a lot of clients out there that do not respect a redirect correctly during that auth handshake, and uh, services like Scarf must proxy. Um, that is a bummer, but that is where we are. And so, you know, this is something that we have. Uh, this is something that we have built at Scarf. Um, we have what is called Scarf Gateway, and the idea is that um, you know, on one side, users can pull down containers and you know, Python packages or any kind of file or sit in front of any kind of URL. You can configure the gateway to redirect the traffic to whatever kind of registry you want. It spits out all the insights and analytics, and then you can kind of switch between these things on a dime. And so you could switch from, you know, Docker Hub to GHCR and back, you know, instantaneously, and um, traffic is not interrupted. Um, and so, you know, oh, uh, this actually, <laughs> this should be updated. This is uh, Apache 2 licensed open source, um, and so you can get it hack on it, play around with it. Um, but how we built this and how you could build your own um, is pretty simple. Like the, that Nginx config that I had showed you earlier, that three lines, it's a little bit more than that to kind of do sometimes doing uh, proxying for certain clients. But it's really just a matter of you can just set this up with Nginx. And if you need custom business logic, you can script it with Lua and it's pretty straightforward. And this is how we built it originally. And that would spit out all these logs and we would process them. Um, as the logic got more and more complex, we ended up kind of 
of scrapping that and rewriting that in um, kind of low-level Haskell code in memory configuration, spits out those logs to Apache Kafka, and then when we have to proxy, we have a distribution um, registry that acts as a pull through cache so that when we are, um, when we do have to proxy, we will cache them internally so we don't have to do those round trips back to the registry. So it can get pretty complicated, but you can get something up and running quite simply, but now you can just, you know, you can just grab our uh, gateway. Um, I will, I can follow up with a, with a link to that for anyone who's interested, but it's just on our GitHub um, at scarf-sh. Now, of course, data privacy is a really, really key thing here if we are talking about any kind of, um, you know, analytics when it comes to open source. And the main thing here that I think um, is surprising to a lot of people is that all this stuff can be done while completely respecting end user privacy by completely abiding by GDPR, CCPA, et cetera. Um, you know, depending on how you store this data, you might run into, you know, complications with that. But like a few principles, if this is something that you want to do yourself, is just don't touch PII you don't need. Um, so what SCARF does is we will, we will take an IP address and look up the metadata that's associated and then we purge the, the IP address itself. So we're not, we do not keep any of the PII and if you are trying to do this yourself, that is something that you would need to think about. And of course, like, yeah, deleting it once you're done. Um, this, is, this is where leveraging third parties to handle this for you can be helpful. And of course, if you're gonna do this at your company, you must, uh, I really strongly encourage you to consult your company's legal counsel about kind of the, the mechanisms by which you do this. However, ultimately, you can get a lot of very useful analytics out of this without touching anything sensitive or keeping anything sensitive. Um, and I think that's something that's, um, I think, often misunderstood. Um, you know, when it comes to the implications of doing this kind of thing. Um, you know, by default, you can have a lot of useful analytics without really keeping or touching any PII. You know, similar to just any kind of web server that you might be running when you have access logs. It's like just a very similar idea. Um, you know, some other benefits um, of this gateway approach that I think are important to mention here. You know, one is that this lets you distribute stuff on your own domain and not somebody else's. Um, you know, if you are using a registry and that registry goes down, there is nothing you can do about it. Um, but if it's your domain, you have, like, it is, it is your distribution channel. Like, you are dictating where you put your stuff, you are dictating where your users go, um, and you are more in control of your own, you know, of your own software distribution. And similarly, that means that you can switch registries on the fly and your users are hitting the same endpoint uninterrupted by this. Um, you can, yeah, like I said, you can load balance between registries. And I think the one thing that's kind of important about this idea is that, me, that, that if, more, if more open source projects kind of take more ownership and control of their distribution channels, that means that registries will be more encouraged to, more incentivized to build good products and not try to lock us into their products. And I think this is a really important thing because Today, if you are publishing to NPM or to PyPI or these registries, like you're kind of stuck there. Um, you know, they, it, you're just kind of playing by their rules and there's just not really a whole lot that you can do about it. Um, and it's very hard for competition to exist in the registry game if switching costs are very high. And I think this is one thing that the container world has done very well to make it very easy to pull artifacts from different places because URLs are kind of first-class citizens in an image identifier, but not, you know, that, that's kind of unique to the container world a little bit, and I think something that's very good, and we should do more of that. Um, yeah, notable challenges with this kind of approach um, is that it's very easy to build, but scaling it is quite a bit more of an effort. Um, so for us, when we, when we migrated this kind of, um, you know, this kind of infrastructure for something that was just like in one AWS region into multiple kind of like the globalized DNS and all the other pieces of this um, get hairy pretty quickly. Um, we at SCARF are still kind of battling with the proxying as little as possible piece of this to just do less and less of the proxying because for us, this is where like a lot of our costs come from that we, you know, are paying to AWS and we are kind of forced to proxy stuff out of, you know, out of our own infrastructure and we are streaming that bandwidth. Um, and then the, this like the many competing container runtimes and clients just leads to tons of like small edge case bugs that, um, we just wish we're not there, but just are there, and that's kind of just the way it is. Um, 
I think that really, like, I don't know, over time, if we, over time, these things are kind of migrating towards the standard, and I think all these things are converging on like the actual OCI registry standard as it was designed. Um, but, you know, as new ones come up, they may or may not work, you know, the, the right way, and this is just something that, that makes it quite hard. But also why it's important to do, because, um, you know, if you are looking at your own stats on your registry, um, there's probably some aspect of that that is giving you a misleading picture of what is going on. And so, you know, the, the arguments that I'm trying to make here is that this registry data can be very useful. Um, it's, you know, it is a shame that maintainers don't have access to it more freely. Um, your registry provider has this data, um, but they're not sharing it with you, but there's still ways that you can get at the information. And I think the, you know, we talk a lot about sharing software. We talk a lot about collaborating on code and having kind of, you know, openness and these, these kind of values that we talk about. But for some reason, that part of the discussion, the values don't extend to the data about, you know, how software is being used in practice. And so, you know, I, I think a lot of people ask, they're like, oh, you know, how can I contribute to, soft, to, to open source and these kinds of things? Like, if you rely on a piece of open source, just tell the maintainers about it. Like, just say, like, hey, I use this. Uh, I get something out of it or thank you or whatever that might be. But, like, that's helpful. That is concrete. Um, and even more than that, like we have ways to do this at scale. The registries have the data, and if we can kind of you know, engineer more ways to make sure that the maintainers have access to that data, researchers have access to that data. Um, like that is another vector on which we can kind of share with each other, collaborate with each other, um, and more. And so for the time being, while registries are not providing free access to this data that they have, um, registry gateways can be a reasonable option where we can start to direct our users to download our software from us and we use the registries as a back end to host the stuff. And this can give us more leverage over our own code, it, lever it gives us leverage over our distribution channels and what um, backing registries we want to use, not which registries we have to use. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm wrapping up a little bit early here, but that's, that's all I have, so thank you for listening. Um, if you want to connect with me, um, there's my details, and then if this is something that you're interested in um, learning more about, this is the kind of thing that we do a lot of at SCARF, whether you're interested in using kind of our open source gateway or have us manage it for you. Um, there's kind of a lot of options in there, and there's a lot of kind of technical complexity to this, um, to keeping these kinds of gateways running, and uh, you know, welcome any kinds of uh, collaborators on the project. So thank you very much. And if anyone has questions, yeah. You're open to questions? Yeah, totally, yes, yeah, we have time. Okay, so one second, one second. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Wait, the camera can hear you guys. So, so the Jenkins project runs a mirror. Your web, your container gateway looked an awful lot like a mirror, a redirecting mirror. We redirect to our mirroring hosts. You said it can be used for things that are not just container related. Could you right. give a little bit more description on that? Yeah, I mean, you kind of think of this as just like a, you know, like a reverse proxy where, you know, you're just rewriting URLs. Um, so for for Scarf Gateway, the idea is you're just specifying input URL, input URL templates, like you know patterns of URLs. If it matches this, do this, and so you know you can stick that in front of anything. It's basically like a link shortener at that point. And the idea here is that if you if you are setting up kind of powerful enough templates, yes, you can sit in front of like an OCI API, or like a tarball, or anything in between those. Yeah, so that's the idea. So IP addresses are not quite users, right? Because you can have multiple users behind yes. a single IP gateway, and you can have one user who owns like a whole block. Yes. Um, have you done? Have you just been assuming that those that those two things even out, or have you actually done any like statistical analysis on, on how that matches up? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so, you know, IP addresses could mean, you know, like, could be a thousand people in a building or a lot more than that. And yeah, there, there's a lot of complexity to that. And um, so what we do at SCARF is we kind of, we have two notions of uniqueness. So what we have what we call an endpoint ID, which is basically just a hashed IP address. And then we have what we call an origin ID, which is a hash of just kind of all identifiers that we can gather. And so what we do 
And what we put in an, or, in an origin ID today is the IP address, um, the user agent, um, and I think in some cases we will also hash any kind of like very overtly identification kind of tokens as well. Hash that up and store the hash. And so typically the endpoint ID is kind of undercounting how many users you have and an origin ID is probably overcounting by somewhat. Um, because yeah, if someone like downloads an artifact from their browser and then from like a Docker engine, that's two origin IDs, one endpoint ID. And so in the aggregate, what we tend to do if we're trying to estimate users is kind of take some average of the two and it's somewhere in the middle, but it's, it's quite hard to get like a real like, this is a user. Um, and in fact, like, like that doesn't even like make sense in some cases if there's like a server or these kinds of things, like what, what, like what do you call that? And so we use these two forms of identification or um, you know, stable identification to get at this question. Yep. So uh, to the other side of that, it seems like IP address plus geolocation is almost personally identifiable information. It's not considered that, or do you ultimately discard the IP address before, you, you discard the IP address shortly after you've hashed it? That's exactly right. Ah, so, so yeah, and I should say, so with respect to GDPR, IP addresses are personally identifiable. Oh, they are. Okay, they thank are, you. yes. Thank you. That's what um, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So they are very much that they are very much personally. I mean, this is one of those things. Like, uh, I'll say a little bit more to this. Like, uh, it's more. Yeah, it's a little more. Yeah. Do you want to jump in? Or okay, I'll I'll just keep going. So, uh, sure. So, yes. Uh, from a legal and compliance standpoint, they are treated as PII. In practice, it's not really that, it's, it's very hard to really actually get at an individual from just an IP address in most cases. There's probably some cases where it is, usually it is not. And so, yeah, uh, from what SCARF does, we will see an IP address, we will look up metadata, we will discard the IP address, and we will save a hash, a salted hash. Um, so it's kind of a two-part question. So for folks using SCARF gateways, um, I guess you have the option of using like X forwarded for headers to redirect to the Docker registries or whatever it is behind the scenes. Um, so that could potentially impact like the data that the registries are receiving. Yes, yes. So as a result, have you had any interesting conversations with uh, large hosting, like registry hosting services such as Docker because you're you could impact their data? Correct. Yes. Um, so yeah, we we do we do work with um, some of the registries, not all of them yet, but yeah, we, we do this. Um, there are mechanics that um, that basically prevent or like you know to, to preserve the uh, the security of the end user. It's like for instance, Scarf cannot rewrite the name of an image. We can't really serve you an image you weren't asking for because the um, because the name of the image is part of the signature that is generated by the registry. So if you ask for you know, MongoDB slash MongoDB and we send you something that is not that, the, the signatures are not going to match and the, and the client will reject the download. That's like the general gist of what kind of prevents the man in the middle attacks with this kind of approach. That's just for Docker though. Like there are other registry types that do not do this, but most of them do. Um, when it comes, so I guess, sorry, the, the second part of your question was if we're impacting the stats of the registry behind us, was that what you? Yeah, largely meant from the perspective of like IPs, if all the traffic is coming from a SCARF gateway, then they can't say that one million downloads are all coming from one place. Right, yeah. So in general, we're redirecting and not proxying, um, which I think is good for a couple of reasons. One, because then we get out of the way as soon as possible and have kind of the minimal overhead add to the request. Um, Handshake, but then also because we don't want to pay for the bandwidth. So like it, it kind of works for everyone in that way. Um, yeah, but however, kind of the, the effect that you are talking about is something that like we are, we are talking to all of them about it right now. Yeah, yeah, ongoing discussions. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I've, we have two more minutes. So you, you said that your container, your, that your SCARF gateway is open source. So right. the conceptually the Jenkins project could deploy it instead of mirror brain yeah. as our redirecting redirecting point for get.jenkins.io. I hope you do. Yeah, yeah, it's Apache 2 licensed. Okay. Um, but if you need help uh, if you need help posting it, let us know. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah.